מלך בארץ, בתרמילו ומקל, ובדי תפגוש בדרך שוב את ארץ ישראל. היי, זה אריה גרין, once again coming to you from the Israel Trail with Tales from the Trail, our program for Melitz Radio and Video. Here is the trail sign, just to show you we really are on the trail. If you're watching this on YouTube by video, if you're listening to the radio, well, today's going to be a bit different. You can hear a bit of wind in the background. If you're watching on video, you can now see as I turn around the sea, the Mediterranean Sea in the distance. We are right uh, at the point of the Sharon Beef, uh, Beach, Chof HaSharon, um, on the cliff as we walk down uh, to the beach. And I suppose on this radio and video series, I have said every now and then, well, today's going to be different, and it has been. And in, in fact, it's been such fun to do this, to return to different parts of the Shvil of the Israel Trail over the last uh, eight weeks or so. And today I decided, making my way down to, to the beach, uh, here at the Sharon Beach um, on the coast north of Herzliya, uh, today's going to be different for a few reasons. Join me as we walk down, and if you're listening on radio, I'll describe where we are on the cliffs here near Kibbutz Gash, near uh, uh, Shfaim, uh, two different uh, Kibbutzim towns along the coast. You can see behind me the greenery uh, of the sandy cliffs, which we're walking down now slowly. And if you're accompanying me by video, you can see now here in the distance how the sandy trail of this national park, one of Israel's real treasures, winds its way through the cliffs, through a crevice in the cliffs, uh, down to the sea. So you're walking with me, recreating my, uh, my descent to the sea. Not the first time that we hit the sea on the Shvil, on the trail. That was back up, uh, coming from Zichron Yaakov, uh, just north of Caesarea and Jisr al-Zakkar, the Bedouin Arab Muslim village just north of Caesarea, um, which perhaps I'll be able to talk about uh, when we return to a few more tales of the trail. Um, but it was uh, the next time uh, that I ended up seeing the sea, walking along the coast as you, as you do, and then you turn uh, inland a bit. Here, uh, coming down the coast from Caesarea, then to Netanya, and then down to Netanya, came here to the sea and spent my last Shabbat on the trail here at the Chofa Sharon, at the Sharon Beach. And uh, I'm going to be talking with you a little bit. I even brought a tripod here um, to make it a little bit easier on the eye for those of you who are watching by, by video. And if you aren't watching by video, I'd like to encourage you to do so as I make my way through the cliffs and you can kind of enjoy walking with me. I'm going to turn it around so you can get the feel of the walking itself as we talk and as we approach the sea. So we're going through sandy cliffs with lovely beach type of greenery on either side. And we're coming to this National Reserve of Chof Sharon. Here you can see ahead of us, just as we make our way down, beautiful, lovely spring wildflowers. And again, the sign of the trail. The trail itself actually makes its way up from the beach here, uh, whereas we're coming down. But I recall coming down, funny enough, which as you can read in my book, I describe by arriving here uh, on a Friday mid-morning, having coming, walked down from Netanya along the coast, and then I climbed up, I left my stuff, set up my tent, left my stuff here at the beach, and walked the way I actually just drove from Kibbutz Gash, Faim, uh, over to here. Walked back up there, of course it's a drive, it's a nothing for a walk, it was a good 45 minutes to an hour to get to the nearest gas station store to get some supplies for Shabbat. 
But what I've decided is, having spent the last eight segments, of course, sharing with you different experiences that I had while hiking the trail and different learnings, lessons that I learned while hiking the trail. Uh, that today I want to speak about the different Shabbats that I had on the trail, the different Sabbaths, Shabbatot that I spent while hiking the trail. I always say when I'm giving talks about the trail, we never get a chance to get into these details. And I could write a whole book about the seven different, very unusual, unique Shabbats, Shabbatot that I spent on the trail. And my last Shabbat was spent here on the Sharon Beach. You can hear, of course, if you're listening on the radio, the waves in the background. You can see if you're watching the video, the sea behind me. And now I'm turning the camera so you can see the cliff. Now, I did something perhaps a little bit unusual. Well, let's even, even if we're recording this, be honest. Something uh, illegal, <laughs> where I camped on this beach where uh, you're not supposed to camp because it's a national park. Um, but I did so anyway, and well, I won't go into that, but I describe in the book how I was rudely woken at 6 a.m. by a forest ranger, by a national park ranger saying, you shouldn't be here, and I'm saying, okay, fine, I'm getting up and leaving. <laughs> um, but the Shabbat that I spent here, which was all on my own, was literally, if I remember correctly, I set up my tent right here, which is just under the cliffs, also somewhat dangerous, if you will, but I'll admit, that, and I spent one of the most lovely, glorious Shabbats of the entire trail. So that's what I'd like to spend the next 25 minutes or so sharing with you. Uh, I'm going to set up a tripod as we talk, because I think that will make for those of you watching. Sorry about that. We're recording these, as you know, if you followed along since the beginning, uh, in a very informal fashion. And because of that informality, I'm not worried about editing. I'm not worried about uh, so much the quality of the pictures. I am interested in the, the sound quality, since it's a radio program. But also from the video standpoint, what I'm interested in is giving you the feel for the trail. So right there, I kind of lost my footing and dropped my microphone and earphone. And guess what? That happens a lot on the trail. Even if you've got decent shoes with a 50 pound, 25 kilo pack on your back, it's not unusual to lose your footing, trip, stumble, or what have you. So there you have it. That's what just happened. And I hope you enjoyed that. I'm also allowing myself and allowing you to join me in setting up the camera on, a, uh, on the uh, uh, tripod. And again, the reason I'm happy to share that experience with you is because sometimes when you think about it and when I describe the kind of experiences I had on the trail, uh, it's hard for people to imagine what it's like to be alone. And the simplest things, like for instance, setting up a tent where you'd think that it would be relatively simple and not just simple, but uh, uh, you get into the habit of doing that and therefore it would continue to be feasible, possible, without a lot of stress, and yet, there you go. For those of you on the video, you know, you probably didn't hear this on the radio, I just dropped the camera again in the sand. <laughs> no, I'm not going to edit this out. Sorry, Ami and Ori, you had asked me to speak and to turn these programs into a realistic view of hiking on the trail, and so that's what our listeners and our viewers are getting. Setting up a tent, you'd think, would be a relatively simple process, especially, as I said, if you've been doing it over and over again for the course of eight weeks. And yet, each time, for those of you watching, you can see different kinds of views of the beach, where I'm showing different angles, not because I'm trying to be artistic, but because in setting up the tripod, it's moving around, and so I figured instead of trying to keep myself in the center of the picture, I'll allow you to enjoy the view. There we go. So, the truth is that that issue of setting up the tent was something that I found almost humorous because whether it was wind or sand or water and rain uh, or animals or ants or what have you, each time was another 
I won't use the word hassle, was another experience, shall we say. Well, today I wanted to talk about Shabbatot specifically because, as I said, there were so many different experiences uh, that I've always wanted to share them. I did, of course, in the book, but I, I don't usually in my talks. And the, the pleasure that I, I express, the gratitude I have for the invitation from Melitz, from Rav Uri, and from Ami Infeld uh, for doing these programs last week because it is such a pleasure to be returning to these, these scenes and situations. But also now, what I want to say is that I've enjoyed the ability to, to go into some more detail with these half-hour segments, which of course when I'm giving a half-hour, 40-minute talk about my experiences on the trail, everything has to be truncated. Whereas here, each topic has allowed me to go more into detail, like I did a few weeks ago with a meditative practice that I shared with you, combining the humility and the acceptance uh, and the gratitude that I, I found so reinforced in the course of those first few weeks on the trail, uh, and going into a bit more detail as I did last week about the, the national elements of the forgiveness that I learned and that I, and that I developed on the personal level. So today I want to go into a bit more detail about the Shabbats. Now for those of you who are not familiar uh, or just to clarify, so I do keep Shabbat. I observe the traditional Jewish Sabbath which means that I don't travel, meaning, of course, I didn't hike, continue the hike. It was my day of rest. Uh, but also, as a traditionally observant Jew, that means that also there are other aspects of Shabbat, of the Sabbath observance that I was uh, uh, careful to, to, uh, to observe and to keep. And that meant uh, no telephone, no electricity use. I obviously uh, didn't have a, a, a lot of electricity with me when I was out in the field. Um, that means having supplies beforehand, as I was mentioning as we walked down the cliff. I had to hike up that cliff, having left my stuff here in the tent, to get supplies and come down. But rather than starting here at the Sharon Beach, I'd like to end here, because that was, as I said, my last Shabbat. And I want to start with the first Shabbat, that I'm going to share a few memories of the different Shabbatot. And you'll understand, I think, even with a very, very brief description of each Shabbat, which I hope I'll get through in the next 20 minutes, you'll understand why a whole book could be written. Well, if you go back, if you've been following these talks now over the last number of weeks, you'll know that the first few weeks I spent in the desert. And the first Shabbat I spent was in a desert, uh, um, what do they call it? Uh, um, ashram, Ashram Bamidbar, the desert ashram, which was set up in an old uh, and kind of abandoned kibbutz down uh, near Naotz Madar the kibbutz called Shittim, and a bunch of Israelis who came back from India felt that it was important and possible to create a kind of Indian ashram type of ambiance here in Israel, so you didn't have to go all the way to India to, to have the kind of meditative, quiet experience. Wonderful place that I can recommend to anybody interested in uh, a, a, a very, um, well, I guess rudimentary, basic uh, accommodation type of... Uh, of experience where you can pitch your tent as I did on a on the grass or have a very very basic room kind of a simmer shared showers and what have you vegetarian food they didn't keep Shabbat but they were very accommodating to me I have to say a wonderful group of people who the cook uh, told me that he was making now because it was vegetarian and very strictly vegan they don't allow any meat into the premises even for visitors coming in you're not allowed to bring meat. And so as somebody who keeps kosher, but also as a vegetarian, I was very appreciative of the ability that I had, having spoken to the chef that I actually could eat there. And he was nice enough to prepare some food before the onset of Shabbat, or to tell me what was prepared before Shabbat, so I could actually eat that, since I wouldn't be comfortable eating food that was cooked on Shabbat itself. Well, I won't go into the lead up to the Shabbat, because there was a whole story, and you can read it in my book if you're interested. Uh, my daughter came down to visit me and to resupply me with, uh, with different supplies and unfortunately she got into a little car accident on the way and it was very frantic those last two hours leading up to Shabbat. But the Shabbat itself was a, a marvelous, wonderful experience where because they weren't traditionally observant, they had developed certain kind of rituals, some of which reflected a Jewish influence, some of which were similar to Jewish traditions but were more universal, certainly taking from experiences that people had in India. I spent that Shabbat a lot of time meditating because that was the environment we were in, doing some yoga. I spent that Shabbat 
uh, observing different kinds of practices, which since I didn't grow up observant, I was certainly familiar with, but uh, had not seen or done or participated in in many years, including the consumption of various substances uh, around me, which I didn't partake in, but which were uh, certainly part of the experience. Um, there was a, a, a point where I saw a sign in this ashram that said, please do not come into the kitchen naked. And that was a little bit kind of, uh, it was a curiosity. Didn't make sense a lot to me how many people wander around naked in general and or into the kitchen. Until in the afternoon after lunch, we saw all sorts of people running around naked and yelling at each other, which apparently is a practice that is, uh, is carried out there with some frequency. I guess a sense of freedom, a sense of uh, 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 destroying all limitations, all restrictions, people running around naked, yelling at each other because they were getting out their emotions, including coming naked into the dining room. And then I understood why there was a sign, which I thought was just a joke. Please don't come into the kitchen naked. Um, my daughter and I shared a lovely Shabbat together, which she also appreciated having grown up in Israel and in a traditionally observant family, modern Orthodox, on the liberal side of Orthodoxy, but traditionally observant. She was exposed, not necessarily for the first time, to an unobservant Shabbat. She was, uh, I think, 18, 19 at the time. Um, but she, or maybe 20, but uh, certainly the first time she had been exposed to this kind of alternative view of what Sabbath rest could be and how it could be expressed. She was more forgiving. She was more accepting of these alternative rituals than even I was. I talk about that a bit in the book too. Um, because I was like, well, this is so much like Judaism. Why don't they just do the Judaism? And she was more accepting of the meaningful elements of, uh, of the practices that had been developed there. So that was our first Shabbat, my first Shabbat on the trail. And it was, uh, for me, also important because it was the first Shabbat that I spent in, uh, in an environment with other people. Um, and it was the first time after a week of hiking on the trail all alone uh, that I had this kind of social interaction. And it was the first time I'd seen my family more, uh, and my daughter. And so it was a combination of a really interesting kind of incongruous being sociable and wanting to, but not really wanting to because I had, I had gotten so much out of, the, out of that first week on the trail uh, being alone. And my second Shabbat was unique. I'm going to use that word a lot, I think. Um, and yet in an entirely different way. Also sociable, but in such a way that made it uh, uh, really uplifting and, and yet feeling very alone. I spent the second Shabbat at Kfar HaShalom, the village of peace, as they call it, of the community of the black uh, Hebrews, otherwise known as the African Israelites of Jerusalem, um, which is a, a wonderful community, vegan community of uh, Transplants from America, you can read a lot more about their history uh, if you want, but generations that have lived here in Dimona and elsewhere around the country, who I befriended over the years of different kind of activism uh, activities that I'd been involved in. And I spent a lovely Shabbat with my friend Prince uh, Nasi uh, Emmanuel Ben Yehuda, one of the leaders of the community, um, in quiet contemplation in their guest house. I learned about a number of practices that they have which are unique. They are not, and they realize that they are not uh, traditionally Jewish in terms of their uh, ancestry and, and also their practices, but their practices include a lot of Jewish practices, including Shabbat candles and a Shabbat service, but with a very, very different flavor of like a revivalist uh, Southern Baptist church service of, of a lot of singing and, and calling out. Uh, they asked me to speak, which I did, and it's one of the first times that I have been interrupted in the midst of a seven, ten-minute Devar Torah, uh, a series of thoughts that I shared about the Torah portion that week, uh, with hallelujah and, and tell it like it is, brother, and those kind of uh, uh, wonderful interactions with the community. And Prince Emmanuel, who has been divorced also, and I spent a long afternoon walk uh, talking about our shared experiences, talking about issues of of humility and acceptance. That was their Shabbat of gratitude, which they every year have to express their appreciation to God for the ability that they've had to uh, immigrate from America through Liberia, actually, in terms of their own history of, of their own transitions, and then to set up their community as successfully as they have here in Israel. Uh, and so my talk there uh, about the Torah portion that was read that, that week 
I fitted very, very much into the processes that I had been thinking of and reflecting on my hike and their, um, and their Shabbat of, uh, of gratitude. So that was, was uh, wonderful and, and enjoyable and restful. And yet also there, I had this feeling of wanting to have the camaraderie uh, and the social interaction that, that the Shabbat afforded me, but also wanting to be on my own again. And I set out for the third week of hiking uh, invigorated and rested. And I had slept in a bed. <laughs> and Prince uh, Emmanuel, uh, his family did my laundry. And, and I enjoyed a lot of interaction with them over the Shabbat. But I was very happy to get uh, rested and, and relaxed back on the trail that Sunday. The third Shabbat I spent was different in a, in, in a different way. It was with an Orthodox community in a, in a small village called Sansina. Sansana, uh, in the Trail Angel uh, um, hut that, uh, or cabin that they had built in memory of, uh, of a young man who would love to, to hike and to travel and unfortunately uh, uh, had passed away. And in his memory they set up this, this cabin in the woods on the outskirts of the Sansana village. And Sansana is a young, dynamic, uh, orthodox community where I very much enjoyed a little bit more of what I would call normality. Um, which included Shabbat meals and singing and, and Shabbat prayers. And yet it was also somewhat incongruous because I had been on my own and not with a lot of people. And so although I enjoyed the camaraderie, uh, I also, uh, it was a little bit jarring. And beyond that, because it was so normative for me, modern Orthodox Shabbat community, I found myself feeling very alone among the group because here I was alone recently divorced, dealing with the issues of the loneliness and the aloneness, uh, and surrounded by people who were warm and friendly and loving, and they all had their family units, and I didn't have mine. And recognizing that I was never going to have another Shabbat like that with my family in a traditional sense of community and family and mom and dad and the kids. So it had its own challenges. But it was a wonderful, and I so much appreciate the 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 uh, hospitality of the Sofer family who run there are the trail angels there in Sansana and I for those of you uh, listening and not watching I'm drinking some water because it's somewhat hot out here by the sea in Chofa Sharon um, and I appreciate the hospitality of the Sofer family um, as the trail angel there um, and I haven't spoken a lot about trail angels perhaps I will in, uh, in the next segment um, because it's such a, uh, an enormously interesting institution, if you want to call it that, phenomenon that is uh, unique, there's that word again, uh, unique to, uh, to Israel um, among all the trails uh, that you can hike in the world. But uh, I don't want to get off of topic, so my next Shabbat was, uh, was uh, a Shabbat, the first Shabbat I had in the field, um, which was in Mesilat Zion, right near Mesilat Zion, near Shar Hagai, which is in the center of the country, just after climbing up to and coming down from Jerusalem. If you remember, if you watched last week, where I recorded at Mishlat 21, at the, at the, the outpost overlooking Shar Hagai and the Jerusalem Tel Aviv Highway, it was a, an hour's climb down those hills to reach the, uh, the Eshtaol Forest and a little park called Park Yonatan, uh, which I and mentioning because that's my son's name. If you read the book, you'll see there's a different name used because I, to protect my children's privacy and the, the privacy of my former wife, we changed the names of, of my three children and, uh, and uh, my wife. Uh, but it was fun to camp out in the park right there near home. Again, very, as I mentioned last week and the week before, very near my home in Beit Shemesh, but not going home. But what ended up being special about that Shabbat, well, a few things. One was... Uh, that my friend Svi, who hates camping, came to keep me company and camp out with me and a real sign of friendship that he sacrificed his, uh, his comfort, creature comforts very much so, to keep me company on that Shabbat. Um, we built a little Eruv, a little uh, uh, string uh, establishment of a, of a community, if you will, if you're not familiar with the, the, the legal framework of the Halakha of Jewish law which enables you to carry within a little community 
but not outside of it. So in order to be able to take food from one part of the campsite to another, we put up uh, a kosher uh, boundary to enable us to do that. We were hosted on the Friday night dinner by a vegetarian family, which made me very happy, but not so much Sui. Um, they're in the community of, of the Misilat Sion community, which uh, is largely comprised of immigrants from, from Cochin, from India, which is a story in and of itself of their history and coming to Israel and the whole ingathering of the exiles, which I speak about in the book more in detail. Um, it was a wonderful, quiet Shabbat out in the field, and I love camping. Uh, and Svi and I spent a lot of time talking about some of the personal hardships that he and I both uh, have gone through, uh, divorce and, and others. And Saturday night, which is not so much Shabbat, but part of the story was Purim. Saturday night and Sunday were Purim, the festival commemorating the victory of the Jews over the evil Haman in the Persian Empire some 2,000 years ago or so sorry, two and a half thousand years ago, the story of Queen Esther and, uh, and King ha Ahasuerus, uh, ah Ahasuerus and, uh, and Mordecai, uh, Queen Esther's uncle or husband, depending on different interpretations that you follow. And I had friends who came and sat with me, read the Megillah with me by, by campfire light uh, on, uh, on the evening. My friend Aaron uh, came and read, and in the morning, my friends Jay and uh, and Emmy, who introduced me to the song that you hear at the beginning and end of all of these programs, Yoram Don singing, Kum uh, Vehita Lech Ba'aretz, get up and, uh, and walk about the land. Kum Vehita Lech Ba'aretz, which is a traditional kind of Hebrew folk song, um, which I wasn't all that familiar with. And Jay ended up reading some parts of the Megillah to that tune. And when Jay and Emmy uh, realized afterwards that I wasn't familiar with the tune, they sent it to me and it became something of a theme for the latter half of the, of the, um, of the trek. My friends Ken and Ruth Spiro and their kids who we traditionally had had Purim Suda, the, the Purim meal during the day with, came down and, and joined me in the afternoon for, uh, for a fun outdoor picnic Purim Suda. Uh, of course, accompanied by some very decent single malt scotch. Thank you, Ken. Some of my kids came out to visit because we were so near Beit Shemesh and Yonatan, my son, and that's the name of the campground that I was in or the park that I was in, ended up uh, bringing me some resupply and also then driving me up uh, most of the way north, all the way to Afula, from where I took a, a bus and then a taxi to get to the border with Lebanon, where I continued my journey. So we're running a little bit out of time, but I just want to mention very quickly the two Shabbats that I spent then before I got here to the, to the Sharon Beach. I spent a wonderful Shabbat in Tzfat, in Safed, in the north, uh, overlooking the Kinneret, the Sea of the Galilee. You may know Tzfat, Safed, as the center for Jewish mysticism in the 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th centuries. Uh, my, my friends Avraham and Ruti uh, hosted me for Shabbat, funny enough, again with Tzvi. We ended up having uh, two Shabbats in a row together. Um, and I wandered around Sfat and Davin's prayed in a number of different uh, uh, minyans, um, synagogues, uh, really absorbing the, the, the mystical elements of the community um, and the experience there. Um, my next Shabbat was very different in Kibbutz Hanaton, a new or revived Kibbutz settled by or... or uh, with residents um, from uh, a community of, I'll call it conservative Judaism, Miss Orti, traditional, but they don't like, and it's correct for me also not to necessarily put them in any specific box. My friends uh, Yaakov, Jacob Ner David, and his wife, Rabbi Chaviva Ner David, uh, hosted me as my trail angel there, and we had a, a really meaningful, inspiring Shabbat, praying with the community, very unusual community. Well, I said I couldn't put them in the box because they're traditionally observant, but also very liberal and open and tolerant of other ways uh, of observing or practicing Judaism in terms of prayer, uh, men and women praying together, making up the minion. Uh, and it was, it was a nice Shabbat to a certain extent because by then I was kind of ready for more socializing, more sociability. So between them and their children, who I enjoyed their company, uh, and the community itself, they had me give a talk in the afternoon for uh, a dozen or two dozen people on their uh, balcony. 
which I think, I don't think I called it Tales from the Trail, but I, that was kind of the idea of sharing some of the insights that I had already begun to put together in my head and in my heart without any intention of writing a book or giving talks like these. But uh, I shared with people there some of the experiences I had both on the trail uh, and some of the reflections that I shared with you over these last few weeks. I'm moving now to give a slightly different view because I think it may have been a little bit boring for those of you watching and not just listening. Um, and that was a, a, a wonderful Shabbat to kind of set out for what was the last two weeks of the trail, heading towards the sea. Um, and then I have the Shabbat here on the Sharon Beach, which was glorious, uh, partially because I love the beach, I love the sea, partially because I was ready to be alone for a Shabbat. Uh, I, I had a lot of socializing, sociability in these last two weeks where trail angels were uh, frequently friends of mine that, and my family, Chagit, uh, my cousin who I've described before, um, and friends who I stayed with in Caesarea, uh, friends who I stayed with in Netanya, um, David and Amanda. Uh, and it was, it was time for me to, to kind of be alone again. And so I had a very nice quiet Shabbat here on the beach. And one of the things that made it unusual is that those of us who are traditionally observant don't often uh, spend Shabbat on the beach. So to, to see how the other half, if you will, of Israel lives, uh, enjoys a Shabbat, I was actually quite, quite uh, moved by a few different elements. First of all, Friday night at sunset, the, Shabbat, the, the beach started to empty out, and I was very happy to have kind of a little quiet time on my own. Uh, but there were enough people walking by that there was a little bit of sociability. I was playing guitar just as sunset. Here, I'll show you. Just as the sun set, whoops, try not to drop the camera. I was playing guitar on these rocks over here. I was singing uh, um, Eli Eli, uh, the song called Halichale Kisaria, a very well-known song. Eli Eli, Shelo Yigamer Le'olam. I'm sorry I don't have my my guitar here to, to sing it all, to accompany myself to sing it with you, but it, it's words including, it's a, it's, a, it's a prayer of gratitude and, and a prayer that these things that we're grateful for never end, whether it's the sand and the sea, achol v'hayam ha'yish rishrush el hamayim, the, the sound of the sea, the, the thunder and, and, and lightning of the skies, and the prayer of, uh, of humanity, that these things should never end and that we're so grateful for. And it was, it was obviously for me very poignant to be singing that here, not at this area, but not, not far from. And a few people walking on the beach uh, just before Shabbat, before the sun went down, heard me and stopped and, and started to sing with me. And that was, uh, that was nice. And by the way, the, the next day, something similar happened. I was making Kiddush outside my, my tent. Uh, sanctifying the Sabbath day for those of you who aren't familiar with with a special blessing over wine or grape juice and a few people walking by stopped to listen covered their head they didn't have a head covering stopped to listen to say amen to my bracha which also was was a nice social ability even while I was on my own and as I said many of us who are traditionally observant who don't spend Shabbat on the beach um, don't see or, or, or have the opportunity to enjoy the kind of interactions and activities that take place on a, on a Shabbat here on the beach. So there were your, your average usual activities on a beach, whether it was windsurfing, sailing, uh, um, jet skis, families playing in the water with balls and volleyball and what have you, the kind of thing that we would see on any other day. But for me, it was lovely to be a part of that and to, and to take a long walk on the beach and see people playing with their families and friends and spending time. And that was my last Shabbat on the trail. And we're now beyond our 30-minute limit. So I'm just going to close with, uh, with a blessing for all of us that we should be able to enjoy Shabbats, Sabbaths, Sabbaths uh, of great relaxation, reflection, enjoyment, satisfaction, uh, and meaning. Uh, however we choose to spend those Shabbats, whether we take a motorcycle to the top of a hill as I used to do when I was first getting interested in, in, in Judaism and, and singing songs with my guitar, watching the sunset, or as I did here as I described, singing songs as the sun went down, 
or in a more traditional fashion around the table with our families. Uh, Shabbat is such not just a holy part of our lives, but such an uplifting and important part. I really encourage you, nothing to do with traditional Jewish observance, but whether you're Jewish or not, the idea of having a day with no phone, with no internet, with no uh, technology which dictates so much the pattern and the pace of our lives, spending a Shabbat, whether it's on the beach or in your own home, around the table with family, uh, in prayer and in contemplation, in whatever way that you find meaningful, is something that uh, I, I wouldn't give up for the world and something that shows uh, how true it is that somebody, I don't remember who it, think it could have been Katz Nelson, but don't quote me on that, who said that as much as the Jewish people have kept the Shabbat, the Shabbat, the Sabbath, has kept the Jewish people, both in terms of keeping our sanity, having that one day a week just to refocus on what's important, and also in terms of keeping us together as a people, unity as a people, and, uh, and keeping us connected to our heritage and our tradition, let alone to our ancestral homeland here in Israel. So that's it for me. I'm Ari Green, author of My Israel Trail, and this has been the ninth segment of Tales from the Trail. I hope you've enjoyed, and join us next time when we talk about purpose and goals and the importance of having those to give our lives meaning, which hopefully I'll be doing from the Arkon River, which has a very specific resonance for me uh, as we get to the end of my hike on the Israel Trail. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. See you, or... Uh, we'll hear you or you'll hear from me next time. <laughs>